hopefully it's mildly entertaining, but we've uh, made some changes to our prayer nights on Tuesday, and uh, we've really been enjoying it. We've we have it so that from 6 to 7, you can come in any time. You can leave any time you want. And uh, we don't have the little folders out tonight here, but um, it's just been wonderful. Some people have really taken advantage. They come for the last 10 minutes. They come and pray, and they have some time with their family, and then they head out. And it's, it's been excellent. So I just want to let you know that if, if you haven't taken advantage of the new format and you want to just come and just seek God's presence in your own time, we just meet here in the sanctuary. The front door is open, and you just come and just... Enjoy God's presence. You know, bring your Bible. You know, even if you want to have this quiet time, bring a book. Meet with God. Uh, some of us are meeting here, and we're really sensing God's uh, heart and presence. I've had him share some things with me that's been very helpful. But anyhow, I uh, hope to see you on Tuesdays from 6 to 7. We are on an Easter series, and we're looking at the road to Golgotha. Golgotha simply means the place of the skull, and you can see... In the, in the painting here, let's go on this side over here, right above those three people is a little skull in the, in, the, in the rock. If you've seen the real picture, it's because the way the rock was excavated, it makes the shape of a skull right in the rock. So last week we looked at the road to Easter through the road to Romans, you know, through Peter's testimony and through the actual Romans road. And, you know, I was pleased to see people respond to the gospel message last week. Lives were changed for eternity. That was beautiful moments. But today we're looking on another road to Easter. This is the road to Golgotha. It's the place, it's a significant place. It's the place where Jesus was actually crucified. Jesus was tortured and suffered at the place of the skull, the place called Golgotha. Would you read this with me? Uh, it says this, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, the king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. It was 9 a.m. when Jesus was crucified as king of the Jews. King of the Jews, crucified. Overlooking that same city where once in Scripture he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if I could just hold you in my arms to be crucified in some ways by your own children while Jesus was on the cross it was understood by many that he had made claims that he would tear down the temple and in three days it would build it up and we look at this and think they thought literally he was going to destroy the temple but hindsight 2020 looking back we knew it was Jesus saying this place, this cross, this death has been ordained since the beginning of time. Since God knew what would happen. I was listening to Ravi Zacharias the other day, and he's a Christian apologetist. And he says, people always have a question, but why did God allow sin to be in the world? Why did he allow evil to be in the world? And he said, well, God could have created four different kinds of, of planets or, or creations. He could have created a a, a planet where we were all robots. He could have created a place where everyone was just amoral and just did whatever he wanted to. There's a third one I can't remember. Oh, wait. No, I can't remember. <laughs> and the fourth one was what we have now, a place where there's a choice. And Ravi goes on to say that it, this creation, this world, this existence is the only way that true love could exist. The only way you can have true relationship, true love. 
Jesus knew. He confessed before he went to the cross. He knew that he was going to die the death of the cross. He knew it was going to be a bitter cup to drink from. It's interesting that from noon until 3 p.m. in the afternoon, there was a darkness on the land. We're not sure if it was just in that local area, but it made historical documents. And people tried to explain away what happened because we know that a solar eclipse lasts a few minutes. And even though they didn't have necessarily the same, you know, astrophysicists, physicists, those guys who look at stars, (laughs) astronomers. Yeah, I just shot myself in the foot there, didn't I? We are actually talking about taking the youth group to go look at stars some night, but that doesn't really, I'm just trying to cover myself now. Okay, so we got this. It was dark, but even at that day, without knowing all the ins and outs, they could tell the difference between a a, a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse and something that lasted for hours. And even people who had no faith were commenting on these three hours of darkness, trying to explain what it was. And they couldn't really do a good job of it. When Jesus came to the point at three o'clock in the afternoon, he gave up his spirit. It was the exact same time in Jerusalem at the temple, and he would have been overlooking the temple. It was that exact time at three o'clock that the Passover lamb was to be slain. The sacrificial lamb was to be slain at the same exact time time, three o'clock, and Jesus gave up his spirit. And it was not to go unnoticed. Look what happens in Matthew 27, verse 50 to 54. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. We're, Laura and I were talking about this this morning in our baptism class, you know, did Jesus die? Well, his body died, but he's God. He can't really die, die. But the body died. The sacrifice was made It was finished. And he went on to go kick Satan's butt, reclaim authority, to rescue us from the power of sin and death. And I'm telling you, this was an event that people were not to forget. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is in the Holy of Holies. Like, you, Gentiles weren't even allowed into this part of the temple. This was the part where only one person, once a year, was allowed to go in to make the final sacrifice. And when that was ripped wide open, it signified that the barrier between man and God was divided. The price, the penalty of sin had been paid in full. We now didn't need a high priest on earth. We had a high priest in heaven We had direct access to God for the first time since Adam and Eve. It was a glorious moment. Now, curtains don't just rip in half. This was a thick, you know, I don't know if it was a foot thick, but it was quite a thick carpet, more than a curtain. He gave up a spirit and the earth shook and rocks split. This was not just another normal human being passing on. This was... God himself was entering into the spirit realm. He says, and the tombs broke open. You know, I've heard some preachers say the story of Lazarus. You know, when Jesus called out to Lazarus three or four days after he had been dead, and he called out, Lazarus, come out! He said, this preacher said he had to be careful. If he just said, come out, it's hard to say what would have happened. He had to specifically call him Lazarus. Lazarus, come out! Not everyone else. Everyone else just hold on a few minutes. <laughs> I got a few things to do first. So next week, we'll see what happens. It says, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This was not a forgettable moment. Dad? What are you doing here? <laughs> you imagine? Like, these were known people. Mom? <laughs> what? And they appeared to many people. When the centurion and those 
with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified. Think about it. You're the guys who was, you know, put the crown of thorns on him and used a stick to beat the crown of thorns on him. You mocked him, you spit on him, you called him names. And when he dies, this happens? Yeah, I think I'd be a little terrified too. <laughs> oh, maybe I did that to the wrong guy. And exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. You know, he hadn't even risen from the dead yet. He had simply released his spirit, showing us the absolute control and power over life and death that he has. This was just Golgotha. This wasn't even three days later when he rose from the dead. This was just when he passed. It's like, whoa, something extraordinary has just happened. It was a moment of destiny. But you know, this is not the first time that the Bible takes us to Golgotha. If you look at this picture here on the screen, you'll see like the little fuzzy marks. That is Mount Moriah. And the dark black gates, or dark black lines, those are the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Mount Moriah was right in the middle, smack dab of the heart of the city of Jerusalem. Mount Moriah. Now Jesus would have been crucified near the top part. You can see uh, it's at the very bottom, you see the golden gate. That big rectangle down there with a little circle in the middle, that's the temple. On Mount Moriah as well. Jesus would have been crucified outside of the city near the top part of the mountain and he would have been overlooking the entire time. This is not the first time the Bible takes us to Golgotha. So we back up down the road to Golgotha and we think, okay, well, here's Golgotha, here's Christ, he died. When did he take us here last? So we back up to 2 Chronicles 3, 1. It says, Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite, the place provided by David. The site of the temple is Mount Moriah. Well, let's go back a little further. Let's go back down the, the road to Golgotha, back closer to the start of things. We go back all the way to Genesis chapter 22. Then God said, take your son, your only son. Does that sound like John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Wait a second, Moriah? Sacrifice them there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Of course, I remember feeling that way. It's like, hold on. (laughs) Say what? But you see, that was normal. That is what every religion in that area of the world did at that time. You sacrificed your firstborn son. That's why the god Molech sometimes is referred to as a detestable god because he demanded the birth or the death, the sacrifice of the firstborn. I don't know what I would do. You know, Emily's kind of my first, but Caleb's kind of my first too. It's kind of like, I have to give them both up, I guess. I don't know how it would work. But you have to know our family story, I guess, to know how that works. Genesis 22, 4 says, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. The minute God asked him, the minute God asked him to sacrifice his son, he was obedient. Now we know from Hebrews that Abraham took a position of faith where he said, even if I sacrifice my son, God has the ability to raise him from the dead. If he could give me to him in the first place and it was impossible, and if he takes him away, he can give him back. And even his statements of faith, when he goes up the mountain, he tells people, listen, we'll be back. We'll be back. Arnold Schwarzenegger, eat your heart out. We'll be back. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Some translators say that Isaac was a young boy. Some people say that he was a little older than that, and that the word that's used in the original Hebrew is close to that of of the attendants who were staying back. And he could have been old as 30 or 33. But his son was submitted. And it takes me back to the Garden of Gethsemane, 
Lord, if this cup could pass for me, that would be great, but not my will. Your, yours be done. Isaac was old enough to understand what was going on. <laughs> not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Derek Walker from the Oxford Bible Church in the UK says Abraham came from Beersheba, 50 miles to the south. And he would have seen three hills. And now this highlighted part is the Hebrew vowel, consonant, I'm not sure how you call it, is the Hebrew letter for the word peace. And Jerusalem is known as the city of peace. That's why it's known as, because of the, is the rock formation. Abraham took the wood to the place of peace. He took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, the consuming fire of God and the piercing weapon. And the two of them went on together. Isaac carried the wood like Jesus carried the cross. Isaac spoke up, <laughs> said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, <laughs> the fire and the wood are here, <laughs> but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Yeah, I love this little joke. <sighs> we should reach the mountain soon, Isaac. But Daddy, you forgot to bring a sacrificial offering. Don't worry, son. God will provide the lamb. But you called me your little lamb just the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But they went on together. Isaac carrying the wood for his own funeral pyre. Genesis 22, 13. Abraham looked up. He had just come into the act when the angel of the Lord stopped him. And we know oftentimes in the Old Testament when it says the angel of the Lord, they didn't know who Jesus was. But we assume it was Jesus himself who stopped the knife from going down. Because Jesus himself was going to do this. Jesus himself was going to be the sacrificial lamb. And Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. And I think it's important that it was a ram, because this was a foreshadowing of God's plan on Mount Moriah. Isaac was not the kind of sacrifice God wanted, and he made it crystal clear. A human sacrifice was not what God required. And then the ram was there, and God made it clear that this is not the lamb, but for the time being, you will have animal sacrifices. This is just a ram. This is a, a, a fill in the gap, a gap fill. This is a shadow of the things to come on Mount Moriah in this very spot. God had a plan. He was taking us to a place called Golgotha, and yet he took them there 4,000 years before it ever happened. So he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Yaira. Some people call it Jehovah Jireh, but that would be a mispronunciation. And to this day it is said, on the mount, on and the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And the language that Abraham uses in that original language is, is an eternal provision, an eternal sacrifice. Abraham, by faith, recognized that something was in the works here. God was doing something eternally here on a place that we would call Golgotha. But he would simply call it Mount Moriah. It was not Isaac. It was not this ram, but it would be the lamb, Jesus Christ. John 1, 29, 
I mentioned last week that John the Baptist was the forerunner, the announcer of the Messiah, the announcer of the Christ. And he announces Jesus to the world and says, Behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The one meant for Mount Moriah. A little later on, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There would be a sacrifice that would take away all the sin of the world. Revelation 13, 8 describes Jesus as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God knew, you know what, you're struggling with sin today? Yeah, God knew that before creation. And he made arrangements to take care of it for you. 1 Peter 1, 18, 20 agrees and says, You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and spot. He was foreordained to be sacrificed before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God has a plan. Can you imagine? We look at Golgotha. We come to Golgotha. We come to this place of crucifixion. And it's a powerful moment. But then when we go down to the first of the road, we realize God has been planning this moment for 4,000 years. This was not an accident. It was promise being fulfilled. I want to take you to Golgotha one last time today. I want to take you there at the communion table. I'll ask the deacons to come and get themselves ready as we come to the communion aspect of our service. When you go to Golgotha today, you know what's beautiful about it? There are no crosses there, but there's the imprint of a Savior. We celebrate his sacrifice, but we celebrate today his resurrection, his power over sin and death. And when we think of Golgotha, we don't just think about the cross. We think about the price that was paid and the difference that was made for us. And this table today, it's not Hillcrest Baptist's table. This is God's table, and it has been made ready for you.